Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, Interim Chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. We've seen some diseases in the news that we don't usually hear about in the United States. And one topic that we've seen in the news over the last month is leprosy in Florida. So I've brought in our expert, Dr. Nancy Wenjanak, the director of our clinical mycology and mycobacteriology laboratories here at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And she's going to tell us more about what is going on. Nancy, thank you so much for joining us today. Dr. Pritt, thank you for inviting me. It's really fun to talk about leprosy. We don't mm. get to talk about it too much in this country, but the recent article has made it a little bit more of a hot topic. So happy to yeah. be here. Absolutely. Well, why don't we start with some basics for the audience? Okay. So maybe you could just start by telling us what leprosy is. Yeah. Okay, great. So leprosy is an infectious disease and it's caused by a bacterium and the bacterium is called Mycobacterium leprae. So it's been around for thousands of years um, and we've had a few cases in the United States for uh, as long as we could remember, but it's gotten some press recently with the recent uh, EID article. And so it's, it's good to talk about it. So it's a disease. Um, signs and symptoms most commonly involve skin rashes um, and bumps and lumps and bumps, but there can be other more significant uh, findings later on as the disease progresses. But most often it's skin involvement where we see uh, patchy skin, maybe hypo or hyperpigmented skin patches. And that skin actually may be painful or it may be like painless. You may lose sensation because the bacterium, Mycobacterium leprae, actually affects the skin, the nerves underlying the skin in that area. So sometimes you have painless uh, skin rashes in, in areas where we have leprosy. So yeah, I always thought that was yeah. fascinating about yeah. leprosy, how people could lose sensation. And of course, that can lead mm -hmm. to more damage down the road. If you can't feel mm -hmm. your hands, for example, you might stick them into the fire and not even realize that. Absolutely. Yep. So everyone probably knows leprosy is a contagious disease. And um, so I won't ask you that, but um, how is it transmitted? Because a lot of people probably don't know how leprosy is transmitted. Yeah. Probably yeah, for a good reason. Said, yeah. As you said, it is a contagious disease, but it's really not a, a highly contagious disease like we think of with like SARS-CoV or with influenza virus or even with a cousin of Mycobacterium leprae, Mycobacterium tuberculosis is pretty highly contagious, easily transmitted from person to person. Mycobacterium leprae is, is much less contagious. It is transmitted from person to person. The mechanism of transmission is not really well understood. It's thought to be through respiratory droplets and it's thought to occur after prolonged contact with somebody with a case of leprosy. So often through like a household contact or something like that. So you don't have to worry about casually walking past someone with leprosy and acquiring it. It's not that kind of contagious disease. It takes a, a prolonged contact time to acquire the disease. The other way you can get it is through zoonosis or through animal exposure and the animal pathogen in the United States is the nine-banded armadillo, interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. So we find that in a lot of the southeastern, south-central states. So Florida, Texas, Louisiana. So we have the, the animal host there as well. So that's another potential for transmission. Pretty highly unlikely, but it is a way to acquire leprosy. I think it's so fascinating that we have this disease of antiquity that is mentioned in some of our ancient texts. It's mentioned in the Old Testament of the Bible. It's mentioned in old medical texts, and yet we still don't know the exact mechanism of transmission. So that's fascinating. Um, but interesting that you mentioned that it is known to be in the south southeastern and south central states. So I guess it's not completely surprising that we're now seeing some human cases. Um, yeah. But it's not something that's common, as you mentioned, and uh, the cases that we're hearing about appear to be locally acquired. Uh, these patients that have been coming down with uh, leprosy in Florida have not traveled outside of the United States. So what's happening? Should we, we be worried? Yeah. yeah, so it is. it was an interesting observation and kind of the excitement in some of the news headlines started after an article was published in the journal Emerging Infectious Diseases and it described a case in a, a middle-aged landscaper who had no international travel to areas where leprosy is more endemic uh, he had no known zoonotic exposure, so 
given this and the higher prevalence of leprosy in Central Florida, uh, they thought that he may have actually acquired it domestically, although his route of exposure is not super clear. Um, so they urge physicians to consider travel to Central Florida when they're making their diagnosis, and especially when they're doing contract, contact tracing for um, patients with leprosy. So it's interesting because the patient had no identified risk factors, but it's I wouldn't say it's a cause for great concern uh, to travel to, to Central Florida or other areas. So I wouldn't hesitate to do that. There, the number of cases overall in the United States is very low. Uh, we probably see 150 to 200 cases a year. We see them in just about every state in the United States. So there's there's hardly a state you can go to that hasn't had a case or two. Usually folks that have immigrated from endemic areas, but occasionally there's a case like this where the root of exposure is really unclear. So, but again, small handful of number of cases. So you, we see more cases worldwide in, in more resource challenge settings. There are about 200 cases of leprosy annually in countries like Brazil and India and Bangladesh. Uh, where they have bigger challenges with uh, this particular pathogen. So. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Wenjanek. That's a great background. So now uh, all of our audience is probably wondering how is leprosy, leprosy diagnosed and what's the role of the laboratory? Yeah, that's a great question because the diagnosis of leprosy is largely a clinical diagnosis. So signs and symptoms, appropriate signs and symptoms, appropriate immigration or travel history or exposure to armadillos or that type of thing. Um, oftentimes they'll do skin biopsies and they'll send it for histopathology examination and for special stains like that. Pritt, I know you look at the fight mm -hmm. stain to look for mycobacterium leprae and mycobacteria in general in pathology sections. So that's probably the go-to lab test are uh, histopathology fight stains of, of skin biopsies. There, it does not grow in culture. So mycobacterium leprae does not grow in microbiologic culture. It's the one mycobacterium that will not grow in the microbiology lab in culture. So the other main lab test used to diagnose leprosy is a PCR specific for mycobacterium leprae that's available at the National Hansen's Disease Center in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, and so if you really have a strong case for leprosy clinically, you're seeing acid fast bacilli in the uh, fight stain on pathology, but nothing's growing in culture, then oftentimes you can send it for PCR to the Hansen Center in Louisiana. It's one thing I should probably mention is leprosy, another name for it is Hansen's disease. So it's named after the uh, scientists who identified mycobacterium leprae uh, in the 1800s, I think it was, as a causative mm -hmm. agent of leprosy. So you'll hear it called Hansen's disease as well as leprosy. There are a few main points that you just mentioned that I'll highlight for our audience. First of all, I'll just repeat the fact that this is one mycobacterium we cannot grow in culture, uh, which I always thought was fascinating when I first learned about this as a med student. But then also that it can be detected in skin snips and by histopathology. So I've seen a few cases and I've seen the mycobacteria really invading the nerves. And that is literally diagnostic for a, a neurotrophic mycobacterium that's leprosy until proven otherwise. And so um, it's always good to have additional testing to prove it though. And we have been sending our cases to the National Hansen's Center, mm -hmm. which we're lucky to have. It's a, a, a US national center for us. But because a lot of the initial diagnosis does rest on the clinical presentation and that index of suspicion, do you feel like there are challenges that healthcare professionals face identifying leprosy, especially since it's not common in the United States? Yeah. I think that is the biggest challenge, the fact that it's so rare in the United States. So it's important for clinicians to keep it in in the back of their mind or maybe the front of their mind when they're seeing patients <laughs> with appropriate clinical signs and symptoms to think about leprosy because it's it's so rare. Sometimes it gets overlooked until all other tests are exhausted. So with the right clinical signs and symptoms, I think thinking about leprosy is the important thing. Um, yeah, it's a pretty rare disease in the United States. As you said, it doesn't grow in microbiologic culture. And the reason for that, just to expound a little bit on that, is it grows so slowly. So Mycobacteria, they grow in general pretty slowly. Mycobacterium tuberculosis takes a week or two oftentimes to grow in microbiologic culture. Mycobacterium leprae grows even more slowly. So you can grow it in like an animal model of like mouse foot pads, but it takes six months to grow it. So the fact that it just grows so slowly makes it difficult to, to 
recover in the microbiology laboratory. But I think thinking about it for diagnostics for the clinician is probably the biggest challenge. So. Yeah, that makes sense. And in talking about diagnostics and then leprosy clinical presentation, are there any misperception, misconceptions or myths that you'd like to debunk for us? Yeah, there's a few myths, you know, very old myths. One, a couple of myths that, you know, people with leprosy, their fingers and their toes just fall off hmm. almost spontaneously as the disease progresses. That really doesn't happen you do sometimes if the disease is not diagnosed and treated properly and it becomes very advanced, you can require amputation because you lose sensation and, and blood flow and things in those areas. And so sometimes fingers and toes are amputated, but they don't just fall off due to leprosy. Yeah. The other misconception from the old days was that you needed to isolate these patients, that they needed to be kind of isolated in, they used to call them leper colonies or leprosy colonies. So much like we did with tuberculosis many years ago with the TB sanatoriums. And now we know that most of these cases, they're not, it's contagious, but as we talked about earlier, you're not going to acquire it from casually interacting with someone with leprosy. So these patients can be treated as outpatients and, and we don't, uh, there's no need to isolate them in separate uh communities and things like that any longer so it's such an important fact in yeah. so many places you still read about how patients with leprosy people with leprosy are shunned mm -hmm. and really treated as outcasts which is really just sad and, and yep. unfortunate and unnecessary, and unnecessary. Yeah. right yeah. so what is the treatment for leprosy well treatment for leprosy usually a involves two to three antibiotics for a period of a one to two years, but it can be cured and we don't have to usually worry about recurrence. So it's fairly straightforward. You know, one to two years of antibiotics is not always pleasant and there are some side effects from the antibiotics, but it is curable and it is treatable. So early recognition and treatment is really the key for these patients. And I guess even to take a step back before that, let's talk about prevention. It's best not to get a disease than to have to worry about treating it. So what can people do to decrease the risk of acquiring leprosy? Yeah, I think you really don't have to worry too much about decreasing your risk. The risk of acquiring it, especially in the United States, is very, very low unless you live with someone with leprosy you know, your household contact, or you spend a lot of time with nine banded armadillos, which is probably unusual. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't lose any sleep about acquiring leprosy in the United States. Um, but I think it's just important for physicians to know the signs and symptoms and, and keep it in their mind for those with the appropriate symptoms. The average person, I wouldn't lose sleep worrying about trying to, to avoid acquiring leprosy. So probably better things to worry about. Yep. Especially so people... with the respiratory season coming up. So <laughs> yes, and we will be yeah. covering that in a future podcast soon. Yeah. Um, but I guess the bottom line is people should not worry about going to Florida, for example. No, and no, no, no. not because there. of leprosy. Not because of leprosy, about, right. <laughs> we're going to go to Florida because of leprosy. So well, thank you, Dr. Wenjanak. That was really interesting and helpful and always good to touch base with you about these. Um, I always enjoy our talks. Last time it was zombie fungi and uh, now it's, you know, old diseases of antiquity. So we're going to have to find another really fun topic, which I'm sure will be easy given all the things that you study. Oh, yeah. Well, very happy to do it with the fungi and the mycobacteria. There's always something interesting to talk about. So happy to come back again in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday. <music>